Let's pray. Father, in the name of Yeshua, we bow in your presence and we ask tonight, Father, for the blessing of your Holy Spirit upon your speaker and upon the hearers that you would anoint your word to our heart and you would give us understanding you would cause an excitement to come that we would be overcomers teach us Father your method of how to beat the system you have overcome and you said to be of good cheer because you have overcome so teach us Father as you overcome in us and through us and cause us to live victoriously in a sinful world. Cleanse us tonight, Father, of all thinking that is not of you. Cleanse us of every attitude that is not of you. Let our minds be receptive in purity and in your love. We receive, Father, your spirit, the spirit of truth, that we may be set free in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Let's go back to the book of Ezekiel. I would encourage every one of you who have not yet listened to the tape of last Wednesday or last Sabbath to get the tape because I cannot get us caught up. And I gave some profound statements that are necessary to understand what I consider to be the deepest message in the Word, the message of the cherubim of glory. Ezekiel 28. We left off there from Sabbath, and let's pick up just before we left off, Ezekiel 28, verse 11, Moreover, the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say unto him, In this manner, says the sovereign Yahweh, you sealed up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of Elohim. And uh, let's jump down now to the 14th verse. You were the anointed cherub that covers. I set you so that you were upon the holy mountain of Elohim. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Title this message tonight, The Beginning and the End of Evil. How did it begin? How did it end? Now, we've laid a scenario as we finished on Sabbath that the cherubim of glory, which are destined through Christ to fill his office, we found out that in Ezekiel 28 that Lucifer, before he fell, was also a cherub. The cherub is the highest order that can only be found in the Holy of Holies. It is a Holy of Holies office. It is the closest office of service that you can do for Yahweh. If you said, what's the best office there is, Father? I want to really, I want to be it. You know, in the United States, the highest office of the land is the presidency. At least it used to be. <laughs> uh, when you have an office, what is as high as you can go? When Father created us, what's the highest we can go? Now, I'm sure every one of you had a dream at some point. I want to be great. I'm going to be the greatest woman. I'll be the greatest man. I'm going to be a president. I'm going to be an actress. I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to be, I'm going to be something. But you had a dream. And probably somewhere in the line, you lost your dream. And you say, if I can just survive, just survive. That's all I want to do, just survive. Father has not filled you with a spirit to be a survivor. That's what most Christians are. They're survivors. Oh, if I can just get through this day. I can just get through my weaknesses. If I can just get there before I really blow the big one. That's, that's the big concern of the church world today. Oh, I hope he hurries and gets me out of here before I blow it again. Well, that's not exactly what Father wants. He wants us to achieve his goal and call. Well, if I don't understand that call, I'm going to miss the whole thing. So he's given us a picture of who we are in Christ. But all of a sudden we realize something intriguing that the devil, at one time before he was the devil was a cherubim, just like we're becoming. Now, how come we're becoming what he was? Well, that's kind of where we left off. So let's kind of look at it tonight and see what we can find out. Verse 14 says, you were the anointed cherub. In verse 13, it says, you were in Eden. You were in Eden. Now, how many know that Adam was never in Eden? Let's see, test some of your Bible knowledge tonight. 
How many? Adam was never in Eden. Well, that ought to just shake really somebody up. I got a. He was in the Garden of Eden. He was east of Eden. He was never in Eden. Now just get that in your system, okay? But this fellow was in Eden, okay? Now Eden means pleasure of Elohim. Pleasure of Elohim. There's pleasure forevermore at His right hand. If you really want to know pleasure, you're never going to know pleasure till you experience it at His right hand. And right hand is the right hand of authority. See, it, you, you are a creature that's made to have authority. And there, there's nothing harder than to realize that what I say has no value. <laughs> what I do has no value. <laughs> Where's your authority? How many know that authority means that when you say something or when you do something, it's appreciated? It's respected, okay? Eden is a place where Father has the ultimate pleasure. It's the ultimate pleasure trip. Now, the problem with that word pleasure is, is that in the 20th century English language, pleasure usually means something quite sensual. Well, the word pleasure in the Bible hasn't got a thing to do with sensual, but may I say this to you? Whatever sensual pleasure is, multiply it by a million fold and you've got a little bit of what the pleasure of Yahweh is. Okay? Uh, it is the ultimate trip. And you and I were made to experience this trip. Well, this... The, I mean, let's, let's go back before Adam. Let's go back before there was ever sin. Let's go back after Father had created all these vast hordes of being and created all these planetary systems. And there was no sin anywhere. Just perfect peace, perfect union. Now... Let's understand something right up front. Father did not create a dodo land. He did not create a museum, an artifacts of archaeology. He did not create cave people. He did not create an amoeba and began it to run its course. That somewhere down in time, it would evolve into something bigger and better. The first verse of Genesis is profound and most people miss it. The Hebrew word, the first word of Genesis 1-1, better sheet, literally means during the first period. Now, during the first period implies that the period is under construction and it implies that there were no periods before it and there are quite a few after it. And we do not know how many periods there were between the creation and Adam. Now, there's two views today in the scientific world. One is that evolution started things with a big bang. The trouble is, there's a little truth in everything. There's a lot of air in everything. And we sometimes associate the truth with air or we associate the air with truth so that we reject either everything or we accept everything and don't know what's wrong with it. We need to understand that at some point as we leave eternity, which is the realm of the Father, He brought forth a period of creation. And in that period of creation, there was a time sequence that was created in the beginning. Beginning of what? Time. Well, what was before time? Father. Now, the controversy is, did Father have anybody with him before there was time? Big controversy. Theologians go back and forth. Well, the first created being was created in time. No, the first created being was created before time, but some of them fell and that created time. And we have all kinds of concepts about where this all is. Some of you, I may be taking a trip a little past your head tonight, and I, I, don't, I want you to just hang in there. I'm going I'm to lead you to a point. I want you to understand something. Creation, the Hebrew word, bara, literally means to bring into being whatever is going to be in a perfect, completed Existence. That's looking for a special word there. In the beginning, Elohim bara. Elohim brought forth a perfect, completed existence. When it says perfected, it means there was no growth, no failure, no lack. It was the exact 
representation of the nature of Father. Now, can you imagine an infinite being that doesn't know how to express himself? Doesn't exist. Whatever will be in eternity, folks, is what was. Remember that Father is restoring. We are in a state of moving towards a position of completeness. We are growing up in Him. But there was a time when there was no growing up. You see, there's been a fall. Now, the whole church world believes there's been a fall. Every Christian knows at some point there was a fall. Well, if there was a fall, doesn't that imply it had to fall from something? Therefore, there had to be something before there was a fall. Before there was a reversal, there was something that was positive. In the beginning, Father had a perfect, completed state. Now, look at Ezekiel 28. I want you to look at this very closely now. In Ezekiel 28... It says in verse 12, the last half of the verse, You sealed up the sum full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You sealed up the sum. You were in your creation, to this being that he's talking to, he said, you were the sum. You were the totality of all that I could create. At that point, you were the ultimate creature. The question is how, if Father's going to create, how does he create somebody? First of all, Father is the uncreated. Isn't that right? Now, if I'm going to make you like me, I'm speaking in reference as the Father, trying to think out loud as Father would think, how would I create somebody like me when whatever I am is uncreated? Do you see the problem? I mean, whatever I bring in can't be like me because I am eternal. Now, let that sink in for a minute. I mean, all the theology books, I've mentioned this before, but all the theology books I have says, well, we don't know why Father created this world like he did. You ever wonder why? Well, why, why, why is there a devil? I mean, why did he allow that? I mean, he could have made a system without a devil. Right or wrong? Yeah. He didn't have to let the devil fall. He didn't have to let out of all. It's true. He didn't have to, but he did. But why? What is the purpose? What is the cause? What is the thing that caused everything to go haywire? And we are involved in it, folks, because if you don't understand how you fit into the cog, you're always going to be saying, why is this happening to me? How come we don't get excited every, every morning we wake up? Woo, hallelujah, it's another day. Let's go live for Yahweh. Well, the reason is we don't understand. Well, how do we understand? Father who is the uncreated, created. And he created by periods. And during the first period of time, it tells us in Genesis 1.1 that that period of time was a perfect period. There was no sin and everything was beautiful. Now, let me just give an analogy. We're living in 1990. And there's a lot of things going on in the science realm that the common people, the street people, will not know about until probably another 10 years. Usually we hear about it from the negative side before we hear it from the positive side. But they've had the ability, using electromagnetic energy, to take physical objects and uh, teleport them. It was done during World War II. Einstein had developed a machine whereby he could take an entire ship and crew and man manipulate it in a matter of seconds from one state to another. That sounds like science fiction, but it happened. It's on the archives. You can buy the book on it. There's records documents on it. The Russian government's been doing experiments in these veins for a number of years. Some of the earthquakes that take place caused by special machines are not caused by natural things under the earth. There's a lot of things that are coming upon this planet because man is playing nature. He's playing with things that he's trying to figure out that can do something that can be very destructive and man would probably destroy himself before man could destroy himself. But what I'm trying to say is, is that they already have the ability to go in space. We already know that, right? But they have ability to go in space above means that you and I know about. They have the ability to even manipulate time. They, they've got things in science that will blow your mind. You'll think you're in the 21st century. You think, well, that, that's what's going to happen in the millennium. Listen, when Father's in control, he made, he made a beautiful world. You talk about a fantastic world. You ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, you take the best movies that have ever been made by Hollywood about futuristic societies. Just to eliminate the negative, you've just got a slight glimpse of what it was before Adam ever was made. I mean, this thing was heaven. I mean, 
You talk about space travel, honey, just hang it up. I mean, you know, he made us to travel. Not only is there this physical dimension, and I want to say, what's that planet out there? I, want, I wonder if there's any life out there on that star. Well, you can wonder that. And I know I'm not being technical because somebody's going to hear the tape and say, he said star, there ain't no life on the star because everybody knows the star's the sun. Well, I know that too. Using like the sun is up. The sun isn't up. Sometimes the earth's above the sun. We, we use language from position rather than being scientific. And sometimes we're taken out of context. What I'm trying to imply, folks, is that there was a perfect, completed existence in Lucifer when he was made. At that time, was the greatest being that had ever been made. And, 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 and to make somebody high, you had to make him about as close to Elohim as you could make him. He was the sum. He was full of wisdom. Now, who is full of wisdom? The closer you get to Father, it is known as wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to make things turn out right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, you mean to tell me Father doesn't know how to make things turn out right? Come on now, folks. He knows how to make things turn out right. Well, into this individual, he put the ability to be full of wisdom. Lucifer was as wise as Solomon. Why? Because Solomon got it from the Father. Well, where did Lucifer get it from the Father? Luc father said, I can't make myself because I am uncreated. Now, let's look at this for a minute. He is uncreated wisdom. Whatever Father does, it can never increase, it can never decrease. You have to just get that in your mind. There's a verse. I don't know why I'm on this, but I guess there's a reason. I think it's in the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's turn to it real fast. Ecclesiastes 3.14. Ecclesiastes 3.14. need to memorize this verse. It's one of the best verses in the whole Bible to memorize. I know that whatever Elohim does... It shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And Elohim has done it, that men should fear before him. Hallelujah. I know that whatsoever Elohim does, it shall be forever. You can't take anything from it. You can't add anything to it. Now, in Romans 11, it says that the gifts and the calling of Yahweh are without repentance. When I just read? Let's see. Verse 29, 11, 29. For the gifts and calling of Yahweh are not repented of. You, in other words, when he gives a gift, gift, he does not take it. He causes his sun to shine on the just and the unjust. Whatever Lucifer was, he still is. How many heard what I just said? Now, there's a lot of falsehood being taught about a devil today. There's a lot of things that are not true about the devil. But there's a lot of things that a lot of people do not know about the devil because they have preconceived ideas and never looked into the Word to see what it really said. Ezekiel gives you almost a complete chapter on a description of Lucifer before he fell up to the time he fell and what happened right after he fell. It tells us that he was a ruler over many nations. This was long before there was an Adam people. Lucifer, in the Bible, is called the, in the King James, the God of this world. When Yeshua, when he came and tempted Yeshua, he said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I will give you all these kingdoms. Remember that? Now, Yeshua could have said, you liar, they don't belong to you. He didn't have to say that because it wasn't true. You see, what Satan said was true. If you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give them to you because they're in my hand. How did he get them in his hand? Why did Yeshua come? To buy back the kingdoms. He came back to redeem the kingdom. Who divided the kingdom? Who tore the kingdom? The devil did. Why is there a devil? How did there ever get to be a devil? That's what I want to look at. So I, I'm trying to get you to just follow with me for a moment as we go back in time to the very beginning of creation when Father Yahweh, in His ability of being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one being decided to bring forth creation. And as he brought forth a creation, in the beginning, he brought forth a perfect, complete estate. See, if we don't understand this Hebrew word, bara, created, the textbooks tell us in the most of our commentaries that to create means to bring from... How many have ever heard to create means to bring out of nothing? You ever heard that in the Christian world? Most preachers preach, well, this earth was created out of 
nothing. I don't know where they get it because it's not in the word bara, and nor is it taught anywhere in the Bible. That, that nothing came out of. How many know that nothing can't come out of nothing? I mean, whatever happened, folks, came out of Father. And Father is the substance of all things, and whatever there is happens because of His substance. There is nothing that can exist apart from Father. Nothing. Did you get that? Nothing. The grass cannot exist without Father. The trees cannot exist without Father. Nothing can exist without Father. We move, live, and have our being in Him. Now, forget salvation for a minute. Forget sin for a minute. Let's just look at creation. Whatever The Bible says whatever is, He created it, right or wrong. He made it. It came from Him. It said it was made by His power. But it is the expression of His power. But if you go into molecular energy, if you go into the, the substructures, into the inner worlds of the atom, you're going to come into a strange parallel universe. Because the deeper you go into the atom, you find yourself in a new realm in which you're going to encounter spirit. There is in science, and we've ministered on this a little bit before, there is in science that every part of the molecular structure of the atom is held together by a mysterious glue. That's what scientists call it, a mysterious glue. I don't know what it is. Yet in Colossians 1.15, it says that all things are held together by Him. He is that which causes it. And the very word spiritual glue is the root word for the very word in Colossians that says all things consist of Him. You can't separate them from Him. Life is in Him. If there is existence, it's in Him. You can't... In other words, that's proof there's a Creator. I mean, how many know their watch just happened to come along one day? Zam! There was nothing. There was no watchmaker. No intelligent mind, just woke up one morning, there was a watch. How many believe that? I mean, that's what they try to teach our kids in school. And how many know that in order to have a watch, there has to be a watchmaker? In order to have a watchmaker, you've got to have somebody that has a little intelligence that knows how to make the thing work because it has a design to it. It has a purpose to it, right? Nothing is made without a purpose. And if Father is the Creator, then there is a purpose. There is a design, and all things have their design. Romans 10, 4 says that Christ is the end of the law to everyone that believeth. The word end there is the Greek word for design. Christ is designed to be the fulfillment of the law. That was his design. You have a design. If you don't know what your design is, if you don't know what your call is, you're always going to be empty. You're always going to be frustrated. See, our, our basic problem is spiritual. We have problems at work. We have problems with people. We have problems with all kinds of things in life, but our real problem is spiritual. When we line up spiritually, then Father can begin to change things around us that are out of order. But the primary reason that we're empty inside is because I was made for Father. That's what I was made for. But you see, everything is made for Father because there is a design to be linked to the Creator. He brought forth everything in a beautiful state of existence. In the beginning, Elohim, bara, the heavens, plural. And by the way, he brought forth the earth. It's kind of the emphasis in Hebrew. <laughs> he, he brought forth the heavens in a perfect state, and then he also brought forth the earth. Period. And then somebody comes along, reads verse 2 in Genesis 1, and says, well, that's the... Uh, this is what he began to do after he did this. It doesn't say that if you know Hebrew. There's a big gap between verse 1 and verse 2. There's been a lot of mistakes made. And although this is called the gap theory by many people, and the gap theory is rejected by many people, you'll find most fundamentalists believe in the gap theory, and so do many Orthodox Jews, which is quite interesting. The gap theory teaches that somewhere between this beautiful, completed state of existence and what happened in verse 2, the earth had become without form and void. A judgment had come. Something drastic had happened. And so from Genesis 1-2 on to the end of the chapter, we have what is called a re-creation. On the sixth day of that creation, man is made. 
When man is made, he encounters an enemy. It's called Satan. Now, Satan was already around, number one, when Adam was made. He was already in his fallen state. When did he fall? And if the scriptures are correct that he was a ruler over many nations before he fell, then that puts us way back. Is it possible that the judgment that's in verse 2 was the judgment that was upon Lucifer because of his sin and upon this world when he ruled it? Let's see if we have any grounds for that. Because you see, always, always, always in any age there is going to be a temple. There is going to be Father communicating with his intelligentsia, his intelligent ones. Lucifer, by its very name, means the light bearer. What is Father? He is the light. Whatever there is made out of light. How many knew that? Everything there is made out of light. All five senses that you have tonight, how many, you know, you see, you hear, you, you taste, you touch, you feel, you, you smell. The, these senses, all they are is vibrations of light. How many knew that? It's all vi forms of vibration of light. Whatever you experience in this world is nothing but a form of light. Isn't that awesome? All the beautiful colors you see, all the things that you can look at, just manifestations of light. That's all it is. He is light. We're to walk in the light. Just before his death, Yeshua was on a mountain and he had completed his Adamic task to perfect a nature, a second Adam. And while he was on the mountaintop, he was transfigured and a glory began to radiate out of his body, the light. When he rose from the dead, he ascended on high, he stopped Saul on the road to Damascus by his great light. said that the light was so great coming out of his body that it blinded him and knocked him off his horse and everybody else was blinded by this heavy light that was brighter than the noonday sun. See, he's light. And, and Father's looking for somebody who will just yield to him and let that light be glorified. But light is contained by what is called a moral... There can be no light without morality. That's why everything's in a moral basis. And since this world is fallen, it has fallen morally. That's why we have Ten Commandments. We have so fallen that if without the Ten Commandments, man would self-destruct. Man would destroy himself. It's an interesting word that the word Torah, which means law, and the word light are synonymous words. When Christ came and said, I am the light, he also said, I am the Torah. Thy word, which is in the Torah, is a light unto my path. He is a light. When he created Lucifer, he created a light being or someone who is capable of showing light. I remember Paul making a statement. He said, beware lest you entertain certain people for Satan can become exchanged in front of you, transformed into an angel of light. You know, he still has the ability. He can appear to somebody with a radiating light. He has that ability. Why? Because the gifts and calling of Yahweh are without repentance. We've got the idea that since the devil fell, he's got horns, he's got uh, a tail, uh, he, he's got a red suit. Hogwash. He doesn't have any of that stuff. If Satan were to appear to you today, he wouldn't look too different than he did when he existed a million years ago. He still has the ability to appear glorious. Father has a surprise. But he can't let us in on that surprise until we find the... Per See, Lucifer was made to judge anybody that fell. That's why he was made. We got into that Sabbath, right? Lucifer, he was the anointed cherub. Okay? He was, Ezekiel 28, 13 says, he was the anointed cherub. Now, we told you Sabbath that to have the anointing, what's the Hebrew word for anointing? To rub with oil. But what is the word? Mashiach. We get the word Messiah. English is Messiah. Hebrew word is Mashiach. The anointed. And you only had three anointings. Prophet, priest, king. When Yeshua came, he was anointed to be a prophet. When he hung on the cross, he was anointed to be a priest. When he arose from the dead, he was anointed to be king. Consequently, we have in all three his threefold title, prophet, priest, and king, Yahweh, Yeshua, HaMashiach. We have the fullness of the anointing. But now, if he was the anointed cherub, and since there is no anointing other than these three offices, then we also know that Lucifer was a prophet, a priest, and a king. 
Now, what is a prophet? First time the word is used in the Bible, which is not the first time that it's used. How many caught that? First time it's used in the Bible is used with Moses being called a prophet. But in the New Testament, it tells you that Enoch was a prophet. Just drop that on you. Moses said that there was coming a prophet after him. He was referring to Christ. The word prophet means one who speaks the mouth of Yahweh. One who declares the oracles of the Father. That's what a prophet is. He takes the divine word and he unveils it. I become the instrument by which his will is known. I am the living oracle of Yahweh. That's what a prophet is. Now, we've got an ideology in the world today. I'm a prophet. We've got prophets in the church, you know. Some people get it confused with the gift of prophecy. You can be a prophet and not have the gift of prophecy. And you can have the gift of prophecy and have be no prophet at all. All kind of arguments on that. It's, some of it's ridiculous and redundant, and it's theological word games played with the brain instead of with the spirit. A prophet was simply anyone who took the word and caused it to bear upon a given situation to make it conform to his will in heaven. That's what a prophet is. How many know that every one of you, when you act upon the word, are acting in the office of a prophet? I mean, how many of you would like to be a prophet? Would you like to be a prophet? Huh? Yeah, forget the negative stuff. I know they got beheaded and <laughs> bad things happened to them. You know, you know I, when Yeshua came, he says, yeah, you killed all the prophets who came to I don't want to be a prophet. I don't want to die. Well, just lay the negative aside for a minute. What was it to become a prophet? Because the whole Bible that we got was written and spoken by prophets. Anything you read came by prophecy because a prophet spoke it. So what was Lucifer? He was the anointed cherub or guardian of the throne, which was always the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Now, I don't expect you to grasp or understand everything that I'm saying to you tonight, but if in the next year I can lay a foundation on the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant and the Garden of Eden and the Cherubim, because it's going to take us about a year and a half to go through this study, this is the deepest study in the whole Bible. In fact, it is so important, as you've noticed, I've been on it now every Wednesday and every Sabbath. This is the most important Bible study on planet Earth, not because I'm teaching it, but because of the type of message and in the hour in which we live, there is not a greater message that is needed upon this planet today than this message. And Satan would love to cheat you from this message. If you can't be here, get the tapes, get the series, listen to them daily. You are going to grow miles ahead of the average Christian when it's all said and done. You're going to know your destiny, you're going to know your calling, and you're going to be a winner, and you're going to be an overcomer, and you will know how to deal with the fellow whose place you are taking and he doesn't like it. He has war, he has made war on anyone who will dare name the name of Christ. Now, there's a doctrine being taught in the church world today, and I've, I've wrestled with this for 30 years. Why do bad things happen? You ever ask the question? I mean, I believe in a loving father. Why did he allow that person to get in a horrible accident? Why did he allow that one to die in excruciating pain with cancer? They believed on him. I, you know, you, you can ask all these questions, right? I've never really heard too many satisfying... How many of you have heard satisfying answers on this? I mean, we've all heard answers, but I haven't heard too many satisfying answers. Well, somewhere there had to be sin in their life. How many know that more things can go wrong when you're living right than they can when you're living wrong? You look out in that world, man, they're having a ball out there. And ain't nothing happening to them. Them pimps are having a blast, man, driving their Cadillacs, bulging with money. They ain't got no judgment on them. Uh uh. They're having a ball. They ain't living it up. Even Rockefeller's enjoying it. I mean, he's getting up there in years, but he's, he's had a very enjoyable life. He has. He hasn't suffered like you and I. We accept Christ, man, things just go wrong like crazy. Well, it's sin in your life. Well, if it's sin in our life, then the whole world already been judged, gone to hell. So let's, let's just count that one. Well, it's got to be doubt. Doubt can stop Father from moving upon you. Let me tell you something, folks. When you're having a rough time, that's the time you don't want to doubt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, if you're, if you're going to make it through the rough time, you've got to have faith. 
And so when you're in it and you're trying to believe, that certainly couldn't be doubt. No, doubt isn't causing your problem. Sin isn't causing your problem. Well, something had to happen for Father to let the devil come at you. How many know that a thief doesn't ask permission to get on your property? Come on now. Bible said he's a thief, right? Now let's analyze a thief. How does a thief think? How does he operate? Well, first of all, he likes things that don't belong to him. And he doesn't ask the permission of those who own it. He just comes in without your permission. Now, we've never been told that the devil can just strike without your permission. How many know he can do that? Now, the devil isn't going to strike those he's already got. How many know there's some people who've made pacts with the devil? In fact, one form of witchcraft is if you sell your cell to the devil, who is Lucifer, the real God, as they call him, we will guarantee you wealth, riches, and health. And that sucker will not get sick, will never be in debt, because he made a contract with the devil. The devil can give wealth too, you know. And the devil can give health. He can keep his little scurvies out of your blood. The devil doesn't have to ask permission. So he can just, boop, sneak a sneak attack upon your life and wham, you're there and you say, what's happening? Now, if you don't know what's happening, folks, if you don't know a thief has just come into your house, how many of you have ever been awakened in the middle of the night and heard a noise in your house and you know you're the only one there? Now, it could be, you know, maybe the cat knocks something off or something strange. I mean, nothing's going on, but your mind does a trip, right? And you're thinking to yourself, do I dare get up? You know, you're trying to decide, can I hide under the covers and pretend I'm not here? You're waiting for something to walk through the door that may never. You're ready to walk under or all of a sudden you slowly get up and you look for your shoe and you're going to clobber somebody over the head. I mean, your, your mind's really going, see? You, you want to go find out what that thing is out there. If you don't know what it is you're fighting, you're going to be in big trouble. Now, what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to lay bare upon you who the devil is in biblical language and give you some insight and have some fun while we're doing it. Is that cool? Okay? So the next time he attacks you, you can say, hey, you're a thief. You don't have any right. Get out of here. How many know that he has to obey your word? Because now he's lost his anointing. Just because he was once anointed to be a prophet, he's lost the anointing. But he's still got the office. That's why he's behind all religions that are anti-Christ. The book of Revelation talks about what? The false prophet. Okay? A false prophet. So he's still got offices that duplicate whatever's in Christianity. Lucifer was created as a light bearer. He, he was designed to do that. And he had this office. He's lost the office since the fall. And we've now got the office and we've got the anointing. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is all about. See, the, ho the baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't just so you could babble in tongues all day long and say, I got it, I got it, I got it, hallelujah. That's not what it's for, folks. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the baptism of the anointing that is abiding with you 24 hours a day so that whenever the need arises, you can step into the office of a prophet and declare the word of Yahweh to every force that is opposed to you and declare it outdated and it has to leave you. You have the authority, you have the right to step into the office of the prophet and speak the creative word of Yahweh unto it and it must obey you. Now that requires two things. First of all, who am I talking to? Second, how can I talk like that? I've never talked like that in my life. Especially, I don't know who to talk to like that when I don't see nothing. All kind of things are going wrong. I don't, I don't relate it to anything special, but behind the scenes there is an enemy who says, you know, I really don't like the fact that you accepted the Savior. So I'm going to make your life a hell. And I'm not going to ask you for your permission. I'm going to beat your brains in every time I get a chance. I've got three of my wet noodles stationed around every one of your relatives, around every place you work, who are yielded to me, and I'm going to drop little seeds in their mouth 
and have them speak against you and lie on you and, and, and speak down to you and you're not even going to know why it happened and it's going to happen simply because I hate you. Have you ever seen an insane person without looking in the mirror? <laughs> okay, now, if, if you want to see an insane person, you know, you, you can go to an institution, you can find a few. Now, I used to have to, every once in a while, I'd be called in as a pastor and I'd have to go visit some of the bizarre counsel them, work with them, try to get them out, see where they were at, see if I could get them delivered. When I walk in, they usually got them sitting in this big, humongous room all together. You know, they just turn them loose and let them have fun all day long, doing their thing. Regular hell hole. You want to find out what hell's like? Just go in there and see what it's doing. It's a little miniature in physical form. Here you have people that are being beaten all day long who've lost the sense of identity, lost the sense of belonging, lost the sense of... They, they, literally a thief has got to them. You see, the first place a thief has to get is to your emotions. got to get to your inner being. See, he knows how to do this because he is one of those inner beings. Now, I'm going to say some profound things in a minute. And some of you are going to miss the profound things I'm going to say if you don't really listen. Because, see, when I start getting real serious under the anointing, the devil's going to all of a sudden drop... How many of you ever been listening to something and all of a sudden your mind's daydreaming, right? You just see pictures, you see, when I get home, let's see, I've got to do this. You're not even trying to do it. It's just all of a sudden your mind's there, right? It's the hardest thing to focus in on the Word. Or all of a sudden, just as a word of revelation comes forth, you get that real heavy urge to just fall off into a deep sleep. I may have had a nap all afternoon. I come to church, I'm full of energy, I sit down, and the moment pastor opens his mouth... <gasps> Ooh, I get so sleepy. Must be a boring message tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a spirit of sleep. A thief has come and has the ability to touch your psyche through which flow all things out of your being. As the Father pours himself into spirit, Satan pours himself into soul. Now, if we don't understand spirit, soul, and body, we're not going to understand why things happen and why we pray and how we pray. Can all, everybody see that there's a function in the area? Now remember, we're in a school. This is a school. You're learning. How many know that you don't go to school and learn algebra in one class? And sometimes the classes get a little above your head. You have to go home and apply textbook headology and say, what did he say? I've got to figure this problem out. Well, the only difference between school and church experience is I give you the homework and Father sends you home with the homework, and that's called your trial. But I'm going to tell you something. If you understand that this is a school for kings, and if you understand that it's not where you are today, it's where you're going to be tomorrow that's going to count, and I have your soul on my heels. Your, you are my responsibility. It is my job to train you, folks. And so the devil says, he's got to create in people a desire to find everything wrong with the pastor just so they can't listen to his authority. I'm one of the very few pastors that can speak without being proud. And that's not easy to say. I don't have anything to be proud of because whatever there is is the spirit of grace. But I can say like Paul, I've been taken out of the body many times. I've had divine revelations given to me. I've had Father. How many know that when Father speaks it, that's it, that's law? When he speaks it to me, I don't have to go learn it now. <laughs> That's it. What I'm giving you, folks, is it. It came by revelation. It didn't come out of a book. We are the next age of rulers that is coming upon this planet. And if you think that this next age is going to be ruled by us who are the weakest, how many of you ever said to the little kid that lives down the street that's a wild embryo, that gets called into the reserve service and you say, if he's fighting for our country, we are going to lose. You ever said that, huh? Yeah. Can, can you imagine <laughs> some of the upper echelon looking into the church and saying, if that's the ruler of the next age, we're in trouble, folks. <laughs> if you're the best there is, we got problems. Because we're in a massive war. Well, there is a war. There's a devil out there. There's an office of prophet, priest, king. Bless you. What is the anointing? He had the anointing of a prophet. He had the anointing of a priest. He had the anointing of a king. He was part of the throne. His job was to make sure there were no defects. Therefore, he understood how to operate in the universe. Now, I'm going to make a strong statement that's going to separate me from the rest of Christianity. 
Because, you see, I believe that there are ten universes. And I can prove it from the Word. Just get my tape on Heaven is Not Up, eight-tape series. Get it down and listen to it. The first universe is the physical creation. The second universe is the psychic universe. third universe is the spiritual universe. And up here on the tenth, what the Bible calls the heaven of all heavens, where Yahweh dwells, where no man has ever been, there is a place which the Bible says that no created being has ever been. How would you like to go where no one's ever been before? That's, that's adventure. Isn't that an adventure? To be where no one has ever been. Doesn't Star Trek start that way? Huh? To be where no man has ever been. Oh, how I like adventure, honey. Oh, yeah, I go to Disneyland. I'm at Adventureland. All right. Okay. We're going to adventure in the spirit. Now, some people can never get out of the physical universe, even as Christians. They're born above. They're born into the spiritual universe. Their whole life is all physical, only based on survival of the fittest. they got Darwin's mentality. They go to church on Sunday and sometimes on Sabbath. But they got a physical mentality. And then there's people that get psychic trips. They're into psychic realms all the time, just tripping all the time in psychic things. And then some people get so spiritual, they're of no earthly value. If we could just find a bland, a balance somewhere in this, where's the Garden of Eden? All these commentaries at home and all these uh, dictionaries, always, I've spent years trying to locate the Garden of Eden. And now I'll tell you, everybody's got a different place where it is. That was Mesopotamia. That was a mess. Well, I'm sorry, folks, not Mesopotamia. I heard a, I heard a preacher at a big convention, you know, 20,000 people there. They found the Garden of Eden, and it's in Mesopotamia, and archaeology has uncovered it. And when I first heard it, I thought, how could it be Mesopotamia? First of all, Mesopotamia never existed until after the flood of Noah, not before it. See, that some people never go further, far enough. Mesopotamia was the first place where civilization came to after the flood in that area. But you won't find it in Mesopotamia. And there's another group, even among our own people, that teach that it's in, the, in Tibet, you get these llamas. Those aren't the animals. Those are the high priests. Notice they're still high priests. Okay? They, 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 they teach the offices. They don't believe in Christ. And they get this psychic wisdom of the Illuminati. Everybody trains under the llamas. And everybody believes that's where Adam and Eve was. And some of their knowledge is still there today. The garden can still be found and they know where it is and they've been there and they've got a hold of the tree of life and all that good stuff. Ha ha. And then there's some people who believe that it was North Pole. How many know there was a time when there was no North Pole? Huh? How many know that if you go up to the North Pole to this day and you look down under the ice, you will find thousands of gigantic mammoths that, were, that died instantly with food in their mouth and food in their stomach, they were killed instantly, not by a raging flood. Gradually, they were killed within a matter of a half a second by a gigantic flood of water that came from above. This was at the North Pole. The Alaskan people to this day can still go up there when they get starved and go and pull out one of these huge mammoths and chip the ice off and eat the meat. It's as fresh today as it was 10,000 years ago. The scientists who have pulled these behemoths out have dissected their stomachs and the food that's in their stomach is as fresh as though it lived yesterday. All of the animals and all of the vegetation that's in the North Pole today only grows in the tropics. Which tells us that at one time the whole earth was on a different axis, different climate. They didn't have spring, summer, and fall, and winter. Isn't that amazing? Where was the Garden of Eden? Well, which one? The one Adam was in or the one Lucifer was in? Well, I guess I've got to break it in somehow. Let's go to Isaiah 14. How come we always get to the good part just as the tape runs out? Isaiah 14, verse 12. 
How have you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer or day star, son of the morning? Isn't that an interesting word? Son of the morning. Why not son of the evening? Son of the morning. Morning star. How many know that Lucifer was the original bright and morning star? There it is right there. Lucifer, in Hebrew, is the bright morning star. Now, how many know that in the book of Revelation, Christ is the bright and morning star? How many know that in Peter, Christ is called the day star, the bright star? The very title given to Lucifer has been redeemed at the cross, given to Christ, and placed upon you. There's been an exchange, folks. You and I are now in the same calling and in the same office that Lucifer was in before he fell. Number one, he can't stand... See, the gifts and calling without repentance. He's still got the office, but he sees you operating in it because you got the anointing. Now there's a war. He thinks he can outwit you. He thinks that he can penetrate into your five sensory realm of life, the five senses, because the physical realm is controlled by the five senses. How many know that? And whatever is received into the psychic realm influences the five senses. Satan has access in this realm. Now, I want you to notice something. Verse 12, how are you, how have you fallen from heaven? How many know that he fell from heaven? Got that? He fell from heaven, therefore he must have been in heaven, whichever heaven it was. Now, I don't know whether it was the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, or ninth. Whichever heaven it was, he fell from that heaven. You got that? Would you like to know which heaven he was in? Would you like to know which heaven he's still in? How many know in the book of Revelation it says, Now, Satan is fighting with Michael. There's a war in heaven. Right? There's a war in heaven between Satan and his angels and Michael and his angels, and Michael is the prince of Israel. Therefore, whatever affects the war in the heavens will affect the nation of Israel. And if you know you are an Israelite, and that's the only kind of light to have, hallelujah. Hallelujah. How have you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the morning? Why? Morning is the appearance of the beginning of light. And when Father began to manifest his light, he was one of the first creatures to come forth. How have you been cut down to the ground that laid low the what? The nations. How many can see that? And you said in your heart, I will. Now, there's five I wills. How many know that Luciferian sin is right there? I will. How do I know when I am satanic? When you say I will. Everything that Yeshua did was not my will but Thine be done. If we could ever get that in our spirit, we'd realize how the devil gets into our life. He has no ability to get into your life unless you say, I will. And he'll put a thought into you, why don't you do this? I think I will. Why? Because you've been trained all your life. You can do whatever you want. You're a free moral agent. That was the sin in the Garden of Eden. Father said, you can't touch that tree. The devil stood at the foot of the tree and said, you're going to have knowledge of right and wrong. Don't listen to him. Listen to yourself. Don't let him tell you what's right and what's wrong. You make the decision what's right for you and what's wrong for you. So we've all become independent sources of knowledge, and so we're all opinionated. The worst verse in the Bible, in the book of Judges, as it ends, is every man did what was right in his own eyes. It was an abomination to Yahweh. 
See, I can really believe that it's right and it's wrong. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What do you need? You need a prophet. You need somebody to tell you which way to go. Now look at something very carefully here. And you said in your heart, I will ascend where? Into heaven. Now, where was he cast out of? He was cast out of heaven. But where was he wanting to go? Into heaven. So if he was in heaven and he's wanting to get into heaven, there must have been at least two different heavens. Can you see this? He wasn't, he didn't fall from heaven till after he sinned. Not that? He was in heaven before he sinned. But while he was in heaven, he said, I'm going to ascend. I'm going higher. I'm going to get something that doesn't belong to me. I'm not satisfied where he put me. I'm going to go above my created position. First, I will. This was the, in the beginning of the first sin in the entire universe right here. I will. Everything in this universe was perfect. Let me, let me throw some things out to you. They have uncovered now in archaeology and around the world evidences of space travel five, six thousand years ago. Buried. They, they just opened a, a, a tomb of the pharaohs that dates back like five thousand years ago. Just opened up the tomb and inside this beautiful model airplane. Can't tell any difference in what we have today. I brought some interesting things called worlds before our own. I was going to read this to you tonight, but it looks like we're not going to have time. But it talks about they uncovered somebody right here in the early Americas that had some strange features. Who was here before Adam? And why? Who did Lucifer rule over? Take any course in astronomy, and they're going to tell you as you go out there to Mars... Just beyond Mars, there's what is called an asteroid belt. You've heard me say this before. There's an asteroid belt out there, okay? Thousands of fragments that were at one time were all part of a real planet. They're just, it's just called the asteroid belt today. But that asteroid belt are gigantic hunks of stone and rock that at one time was part of a massive planet just beyond Mars. The science, this is not... New age, folks. This is not occult knowledge. This is scientific, okay? This is, I got this when I was in Santa Ana College taking a course on astronomy a few years back. It says in, in the course, there's only two explanations. Either some comet, gigantic-sized comet, or some asteroid was coming through our universe at that time, got so close that the magnetic pull was so great that it just caused it to explode. But scientifically, they doubted that. They only had one other explanation. <laughs> there was a massive intergalactic war. Now, the oldest records we have talk about a war between the children of light and the children of dark. The Yahwehist, as it's called in the text. How many know there's writings out there like that in other religions? Yahwehist, the children of Yahweh. <laughs> and they had a war with somebody else, and there was all these war machines flying through the air. Do you think that the Wright brothers were the first brains in the history of the universe? When Father says he created this universe in a perfect state? Disneyland still looks like a caveman's land compared to heaven. That's why a lot of inventions were given to the ungodly because Satan wants the ungodly to get the inventions in the glory first so that Yahweh doesn't get the record. Because you see, he was once a part of it. He is the original light. That means the knowledge of inventive power is within him. Who do you think gave the knowledge of destruction in the atomic bomb? All it is is using atomic energy in the false. It's the knowledge of evil. 
who was wrapped around the tree of the knowledge of evil? The snake. Who was the snake? Who was... It says that, that ancient serpent, that old serpent. It calls him by the name the old serpent. Now, it's interesting that the Hebrew word for serpent there is nakash. And all of a sudden, archaeology in the last five years uncovered all kinds of records. One of the oldest ancient civilizations that ever existed dates back 5,000 B.C., beyond, way back. It's called the tribe of the Nakash. Hmm. And you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Does anybody care about what I'm saying? Is this interesting to you or is it just me? Am I having fun or... Huh? Yeah. yeah, am I boring you? <laughs> hallelujah. No, no. Uh, hallelujah. I can close right now. Lucifer became known as Satan, which means the opposer. What does he oppose? Whatever you stand for. Whatever. The moment you say, I'm going to do this for Father, guess what? There's somebody who's going to oppose you. And right away you will find somebody just out of the clear blue sky will just come at you and say, you are stupid. I mean, have you ever made a statement and all of a sudden there it is? I mean, somebody's opposing you. Say, the moment you really decided to do something for Father, do something for the church, everything goes wrong. Satan. Now, once you understand that, you understand that it's a personal battle which this is why Father says in Ephesians 6, put on the armor of Yahweh because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But what you're looking at in the natural is flesh and blood. But beyond them are forces that are using them as humans to get at you, to get you to fall without you using your office of prophet, priest, and king. Now, you've got to understand that you are a prophet. The moment you were born, you were born into the office of a prophet. You were born into the office of a priest. You were born into the office of a king. But they're progressive, folks. You can't become a king until you're first of all a prophet. You can't become a priest until you first of all understand the office of a prophet. Because a priest must minister on the Word, but you've got to know the Word before you can minister on it. And a king is one who rules. Now, in Israel, they were broken into three classes because of sin. But through Christ, the office has been restored to an, a total unity office, which in the Bible is called the Melchizedek Order. Read it in Hebrews 7. A Melchizedek Order is the order where all of a sudden you begin to walk in all three anointings simultaneously, daily. And this is the group that is going to handcuff Satan personally at the end of this age and throw him into the bottomless pit. Would you like to have a hand in that? You're going to have to conquer whatever he throws at you. Let me tell you something, folks. The Bible also says that there is no trial taken you, but such as is common to man, but Father will, with that trial, make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. What's he saying? You think, I'm being tried beyond my ability. Well, based upon your feelings, that may be true. But if it's happening to you, it's because you can take it. But you have to give yourself a chance and rise up within the office. It is the anointing that what? Breaks the yoke. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is the anointing that breaks the yoke. The anointing is not a feeling, folks. The anointing is an office which when you get into that office is when you can destroy the works of the devil, which is a counterfeit work to counterfeit prophet, priest, and king against you, where things go against you instead of for you. And you don't have to be spiritual. Anything you want in life will be a daring challenge for you to rise up and say, I resist the opposition. But most of us have just said, oh, whatever happens, happens. Braver me that I'll make it. Sometimes when we say it, you almost think we were inebriated. 
pray for me that I'll make it. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to make fun of anybody because, hey, thousands of times I've been sitting here saying, I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> All of a sudden, Father begins to rise inside me and says, Who are you? I don't know. You want to tell me? <laughs> now, see, some of you probably don't have the problems that I have. See? See? Yeah. Unfortunately, Father picked a human to be a pastor. I said, Father, I'm not fit for this task. There's times when I have resigned, given up. And Father says, I reject the application. <laughs> I've gone to him and said, but I'm a failure. He says, wrong reason. I have sinned. Wrong reason. How many believe that sin's the reason that Father will kill you? <laughs> If it wasn't for sin, wouldn't we have it made, folks? <laughs> it, it's, it's the awareness that I'm blowing it every single day. And I don't know why. And I hate myself for it. I could be so spiritual if it wasn't for me. <laughs> if I could just close myself to the five senses, man, I could have it made. If I didn't have to see you, listen to you. <laughs> if I didn't have to feel nothing negative, just... Total bliss. Just live in heaven all day long. Right? Get up in the morning. Don't say nothing bad to me. Don't give me no bad news. Don't, don't let nothing bad happen to me. Then I'll serve you. Wrong reason to serve him. When you get to the place where you say, if I go to hell, I'll serve you in hell. Well, that's what Father's looking for. He wants somebody who will say, Father, I want you so bad that I want to serve you in spite of me. Father will take that desire and he'll actually beat the devil's brains in using your life. And he gives you by grace the office of the anointing that abides in you all the time. There is a prophetic office in you 24 hours a day. There is a prophetic priesthood within you 24 hours a day. But it requires you to step into the office and to speak the word. And when you learn to walk in the word... Learn to speak the Word. Learn to respond to the Word. Even though every part of you is rebelling against it, you've, you're learning to be a king. And that is totally going to destroy the devil. When you put the devil under your feet, you can then become a powerhouse prayer warrior for the church and you join yourself to the church. And there isn't a church in this world that isn't going to conquer once it reaches that place. Now, that again hasn't got anything to do with knowledge. See, Larry Lee's church is, is a fine example of a real praying church. I mean, you've got 10,000 people that meet. they they got prayer meetings going 24 hours around the clock. Young Paul Cho in Korea, the biggest church in the world. Prayer meetings that are going 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Thousands are in that prayer meeting. Thousands. But he started with a little group just like this. It took him a few years. And a couple times he almost lost it, but Father began to multiply it. Why? Because he understood the prophetic office. See? And that prophetic office becomes when you get all three prophetic... When you learn it... First of all, I'm here to teach it to you. When you learn it and you begin to operate in it, that is the office of the cherubim. He was the cherub. Now, just because the gifts are without repentance, he still has these offices. Therefore, he can act against you. He can officiate against you. Unless you rise up in that same office and contest him, only differences with the anointing and the anointing will break the yoke and that's why the Spirit is given to you. And it is a gift. You've got everything in your arsenal to destroy the devil. Why does he do like he does? Why does he operate like he does? How did he get this power? That's what we're trying to understand. I'd like to break down to you what Lucifer was doing before he ever fell, where he was, and how he fell, and how it's affected this planet, and how, why he still has authority in people today, and how he's going to be destroyed coming up. That's why I call this the beginning and the end of evil. But Christ is not going to do it apart from people. 
Why can't Father just come back and say, Zap! You're dead. We do that. The Father won't do that, folks. See, Lucifer was his pride and joy. And you'll never understand the love of a, of a creator, which is greater than the love of a father, until you understand he has great love for his creation, even if it blows it. But he hates what Lucifer is doing at this point. And the only way he can destroy his ability is to destroy him through the cross. And so Christ came under the power of Satan and allowed Satan to bring him to the cross and bring him into the very pits of hell whereby he destroyed the very principle of the self-life and is raising up a new creation people who have been raised up above all principalities and powers and given the power to rise against the devil and put him back in his place. Now it's interesting that it is in the prophet Ezekiel that you read all of these things. You read the cherubim, you read the life story of Lucifer and his fall in the prophet Ezekiel. But it's also in the prophet Ezekiel, who was a priest. You'll also read the most prophetic statements ever found anywhere in the entire Bible. And it's also in Ezekiel that you'll find the ultimate temple of the last days. The seventh temple of Yahweh is in the last eight chapters of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is probably the least preached book in Christendom. And yet, to the overcoming Christian, Ezekiel is the most important book in the Bible. And without it, you can't totally understand the book of Revelation or your call. Ezekiel is told to go to a valley of dry bones representing the nation of Israel. It's dead. It's gone. Forget it. And Ezekiel, the priest, now becomes a prophet. He says, what do I do? He says, I'm going to put my words in your mouth. If you'll speak my words I put in your mouth to that boneyard, I will make it come alive. I'm not too sure Ezekiel really believed all that at first. I imagine as he walked into that graveyard and looked at all them dead bones, he said, there ain't no way. A lot of you here tonight got a bunch of dead bones in your graveyard. You're saying, that'll never come back. I'll never have that restored. I'll never be happy again. I'll never be achiever again. And all of a sudden, here comes the prophetic word. Speak to your boneyard. Ezekiel gets up to that boneyard. You know what he said? Hear, O bones, the word of Yahweh. First of all, you've got to hear it, right? How does faith come? By hearing. By hearing. Are you hearing tonight? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. Hear the Word! But wait a minute. That was not the Word. The Word was, Live, O bones! Isn't that profound? You're covered with death. And he says, live. It's interesting, because the word live is the same word for cherubim. Life. Beings in, who's full of life. You know what? If you're full of life, there's no more death. Well, let that sink in. How would you like to know all of a sudden nothing's going to die anymore? You're not going to lose anything. No thief's going to come into your life and take what is properly yours as long as you can stand in the prophetic office and declare lie because it's coming from the office of a cherub which office means fullness of life I am alive how many know what life is life is described in the dictionary as energy but if you look up the, def the dictionary definition of the word energy it's light Let your light shine. How are you going to let light shine? You've got to turn on the power. 
presence in the office. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. A gift of grace to you to overcome the enemy. Well, we about wore this introduction into the ground. Maybe Sabbath. We'll pick up here and find out just what Lucifer was doing and what heaven he was in and what did he look like. I don't know about you. I like to, I enjoy the Bible. I, you know, I, little verses, they, they, they get to me, you know. They get to me. That's just, just for fun. Let me, can I have about 30 more seconds? Yeah. He's, he, he gives the I wills five times. And then Father says in verse 15, Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol. Verse 16, They that see you shall gaze at you, and they shall consider you, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? Now, when you finally see the devil, what is the expression you're going to be saying? Is this the man? Right? Now, those of you that have heard my other messages, what is the word for man there? It's not Adam. It's four words in Hebrew for man. Which, which word is it? Ish. 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 Now, is this the Ish man? Now, wait a minute. If Lucifer was an Ish kind of man, and does away with the angel theory, doesn't it? Now, if... Oh, oh. Heresy. Anyway, if Lucifer is called an Ish man in Hebrew, who was the first man ever to be called Ish in the Bible? Adam. Because when Eve was made, he said, Thou art woman, for from man were you taken. In Hebrew it says, Thou shalt be called Ishi, for from Ish were you taken. So Adam was an Ish man. So Adam was both an Adam man and an Ish man, but Lucifer was an Ish man, but he wasn't an Adam man. Just let that settle in for a second. Let me take it a little further. He was an Ish man. Now, Father said in the book of Hosea that in the last days I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and they shall be known as a covenant people to me because they will be called by my name. Now, his name is the Ish people because it is a married name. When Adam and Eve came together, they were called Ish Isha, Ishi. That was a marriage contract. Okay? Marriage contract. Father said he's going to marry Israel. They would become known as the Ish people. So today, the covenant people are known by the Ish name. Swedish, Spanish, English, Scottish, what else? Irish, what else? Danish, you're getting on. Jewish, I hate to say it, yes. What else? Huh? What else? Any other issues? Huh? Scottish, yeah, we said that. There's a, there's, there, there's a number of Ish people, right? And most of you here are somehow related to the Ishness of it. And if, and, and if not, that's cool because through Christ you become an Ish. Now, as I heard one of the pastors in Costa Mesa made the statement, that was foolish. <laughs> Let me give an answer to that if I could. The Bible said there's nothing worse than his own people who act as fools. But then his people who deny his word are called foolish and make...